Now, very first story, President Kufado says his administration is working tirelessly to ensure the many allegations of corruption and financial malfeasance leveled against members of the previous government are tried. Speaking at his meeting at Media Encounter at the Flagstaff House on Tuesday, he said already many of the cases are being worked on. He, however, says the cases would be sent to trial only after it has been established that there is enough evidence to prosecute the people involved. When the time comes for them to find their area in the form of prosecutions, it's my expectation is that there will not be flimsy cases. They will not be about an attempt to witch hunt members of the last government. I'm not going to lend myself to that exercise. We're going to bring cases, and there will be cases. There are several in the pipeline that I'm aware of, but cases that will make it clear to the courts and also to public opinion that, yes, something wrong took place there, which requires the intervention of the courts. Um, I will, I, the, uh, the special prosecutor, when he comes, will help. But the, the already instruments for enforcing the criminal law, which are already in place, so it cannot be a question of waiting for the special prosecutor. It's a question of making sure that whatever is brought into the public domain as cases are thoroughly well-researched, well-documented, and that they are strong cases and not just flimsy exercise playing to the gallery. No other bill that will see the establishment of the Office of the Special Prosecutor, one of the major planks of the Kufa administration's anti-corruption crusade, was laid in Parliament on Tuesday. Yava nearly suffered a hitch when the minority in Parliament attempted to block it. Former Deputy Attorney General Dr. Dominic Ayene told the Speaker the Constitution requires that all bills are gazetted by the Ghana Publishing Company 14 days before it is brought to the House and said his check suggested this had not been done. In respect of the special prosecutor's bill, Mr. Speaker, I have checked with the government printer, the Assembly Press, and it has not been gazetted. Contrary to Article 106 of the Constitution and Order yeah. 120 of the Standing Orders, which require that before the bill is introduced into this House, it must be gazetted 14 days prior to its introduction in this House. And the majority leader has just pointed out that there is some disparity. We would want to see the gazetted evidence so that it conforms to what is being laid here. So, right honorable speaker, may you direct, may I uh, plead with you to direct that the Attorney General, as well as the Minister for Zongo Affairs, uh, produce the Gazette notification. But Majority Leader Sechi Mensah Bonsu said that requirement could be waived since the bill was coming to the House under a certificate of urgency. Speaker Professor Michael Kwe agreed. Let him advert his mind to article, the same article 106.13, which provides where it is determined by a committee of parliament appointed for the purpose that the particular bill is of urgent nature, the provisions of the preceding clauses of this article, other than clause 1 and paragraph A of clause 2, shall not apply. Because because what it means is that for the whole of article 106, if a bill is determined and is certified to be of an urgent character, those provisions, other than the assent, can you sit down? I sat down there and listened to you. Jessica, you have referred the matter to a committee. Government indeed considers these bills as very urgent. The determination is for the committee. Once the committee that you have referred the bills to make a determination, then, Mr. Speaker, we can go on. And I will show him that, in fact, the language and tenor of the construction in Article 106 13 is clear. It's crystal clear. And this House has precedence. Mr. Speaker, that is the way to go. Honorable members, this is a very straightforward matter. We all know that at all times, the urgency or otherwise of such bills are determined at our committee stage.
In a related development, U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Robert Jackson, has called on government to ensure the establishment of the Office of Special Prosecutor has enough power to bring anyone who falls foul of the law to book, regardless of their influence in society. President Kufuado made the promise to set up the office in the run-up to the 2016 election to primarily check corruption. Speaking at the launch of the African Center on Law and Ethics, Ambassador Jackson revealed the embassy has provided support to the AG's department in the form of sponsoring state attorneys to study how similar offices of special prosecutors operate in the U.S. There is more in this report by Joseph Akable. The center is to provide an intellectual base for discourse on the importance of law and ethics. Students of law and practitioners alike will receive training aimed at ensuring that the best standards of legal profession is upheld. Delivering the opening address, former Chief Justice Georgina Theodora Wood underscored the need for high ethical standards in the legal profession. It is a partnership also between Ghana and the United States in many respects. It is a partnership with people and by people from different parts of the world with different perspectives but all united in the belief that law and ethics deserve a platform to fully develop a healthy and robust agenda to ensure that these two elements, law and ethics, take their proper seat at the table of any conversation, particularly conversations regarding our national growth and development. Fighting corruption through the legal system has often been touted as a sure way of ending the menace. With plans for an office of special prosecutor already in motion, U.S. Ambassador to Ghana Robert Jackson urged government to ensure independence of the office. In the next few weeks, perhaps days, Parliament is set to debate a bill being crafted by the Office of the Attorney General that will create an office of the special prosecutor focusing on corruption-related crimes. The embassy is sponsoring a handful of attorneys from the Attorney General's office to travel to New York and to Washington so that they can study special prosecutor offices in the United States and incorporate best practices here in Ghana. My hope is that once established, the special prosecutor might be granted the freedom and latitude to prosecute cases independent of political and social influence. My hope is that no one, including not one of the judges implicated by Anas, would be too powerful or influential to escape the special prosecutor's scrutiny. The center's training program commenced on Tuesday, July 18. And returning to our top story, the president of the media encounter today also said although there has been significant improvement in power supply the country is still not where he envisages it envisages it to be in terms of energy he reckoned that development has been a great threat to businesses and the cost of living in the country today things have improved quite a lot but we are not yet where we should be particularly with regard to the cost of energy this is a great threat to the operations of business and the cost of living in the country. The Minister for Finance, in collaboration with the Minister for Energy, is at an advanced stage of floating the 2.5 billion energy bond to retire the 2.4 billion dollar debt overhang on the energy sector. This development will attract more investment into the center, into the sector and reduce the cost of energy. I am much relieved, however, that the supply and distribution have improved and we're working to bring costs down and make energy supply generally more reliable. While well, staying with energy, the president touched on the boss saga and said he would rather wait for the committee set up to investigate the issue to come out with its findings. I want to reiterate that even though investigations have been concluded by the security agencies and the National Petroleum Authority, a nine-member committee under the chairmanship of Dr. Lawrence Dakwa, head of the Petroleum Engineering Department of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, 
has been set up by the Minister for Energy. Amongst others, the committee is tasked with making recommendations to ensure that we put the era of contaminated and off-spec products behind us by tackling issues such as the integrity of the pipeline infrastructure, improving pipeline operations and maintenance, continuous training and skills upgrade of pipeline operators, and implementing improved standard operating procedures, including the controlled evacuation and disposal of products under the direct supervision of the National Petroleum Authority. Well, residents of the Ashanti Regional Capital, Kumasi, have been reacting to President Kufado's media encounter on Tuesday. Let's watch some of them. The interchanges, he said everything will be okay. And they are going to do the rules and other things, but it's all due to, uh, for money. But uh, automatically, they will, they will be doing it. So for, for that matter, I was happy about it. Because I'm living in the Ashanti region, and we all know that the Ashanti region network rules and all this, the capitation, especially capitation, have been in this country for, for, for almost five years in the Ashanti region, and we have suffered to it. So uh, I like the way he respond today. The lady asks about the award being presented to Nana Kufuadu. Instead of going to uh, the question which concerning Ghanaians, he rather attack him personally by asking questions pertaining to uh, the award being given to him. I was not happy for her to ask such a question. I remember very well, if my mind says me right, I recall um, Vim Lady asked a question, it has to do with, um, I can't recall the very question, though, but I think, no, it has to do with these security staff where um, the mines minister, I think, where a gadget was stuck in the minister of, is it mines and energy? Yeah, yeah. Very well. And that, um, he was complaining that, is it not an issue that, um, where they were holding the program, those gadgets could be stuck there and that the security is not assured. It was like, oh, even if it is, I think some of them, they are very uh, okay with whatever is happening there. So I think um, subsequently to, he was very calm and responded accordingly to, accordingly to the question that was asked perfectly. So I see probably, I might not recall all those responses he gave, but for me, and I don't want to be politically biased, but for me, it was on point. I would say very well. They asked very intelligent questions. Um, and I remember there was one, oh, I think after his questions, he made a very statement, which of course made some of us very loud. I think he commended the very attire Akufado was wearing. And some people were like, why would he go that very extent? So some of us, I think, apart from the fact that you do a very good job and that all work and no play make a jack, jack a dog boy, it was good those questions to us who were turned up to. But I think it was a good. Now there'll be more reactions to the present media encounter on Joy News Interactive, which comes up later on in the bulletin. But still ahead in the bulletin, traders at Cape Coast Quarter Private Market live up to their threat to demonstrate of what they describe as unfair allocation of stalls at the newly refurbished market. Now, scores of traders and assembly members in the Cape Coast metropolis Tuesday hit the streets in protest of what they refer as the unfair allocation of stalls at the Kotograva market. The assembly members and traders are petitioning the president to call the regional minister and the MCE for Cape Coast to order as their actions are depriving them of their livelihoods. The protesters allege that the stalls being allocated to MPP are being allocated to MPP functionaries, friends, and even foreigners without any consideration of the old occupants of the market. Correspondent Richard Kojunako joined the demonstrators and has filed this report. These scores of assembly members and traders, obviously unhappy with the sharing of the Kotokrava market stores, are here in their numbers. 
they hold placards that read, Kwam Nadan can keep your hands off the Kodokraba market. We were there before your parents were born, and the market is not yours. Stop taking possession and a host of other inscriptions. With the aid of a brass band music, the demonstrators danced their way through the principal street of Cape Coast with a petition to be delivered to the regional minister and the MC for Cape Coast. But unfortunately, they still have the petition in their hands because there was no one to hand over the petition to. Justice George Arthur led the demonstrators. Look at the petition that I'm holding. Now, this is the court petition that we wanted to bring to the MC or the coordinating director or the deputy coordinating director. They were all told to vamoose. And you can see clearly that they are vamoose from the premises of the Metro Assembly. But we are telling Ghanaians that certainly whatever they will do, wherever they will hide, we are going to present this petition to them. But let me tell you that the uh, judge or the court has actually served the, the uh, lawyer of the assembly and they are going to get hold of it. And I can assure all Ghanaians that justice will prevail because we are going to put injunction on the market. And we are also cautioning the market women who have already been into the market that they shouldn't dare. From today, they should move their items, otherwise they will lose it. Because if you make an attempt to go and open the place, certainly contempt will... will, will. Some of the traders who unfortunately were not allocated some of the market stores are forewarning the new occupants who they think do not deserve some of the market stores to vacate the stores, otherwise they will know no peace. <laughs> I've been here three consecutive times. I've seen people who were no, who, who originally did not even have um, shops or stores or even ITS, but they've been given sh uh, shops and their stores. So all we are asking is they should take back the keys, reinvestigate, and make sure when anyone who has an old shop is given his what whatever he's due. Grandmom has stayed in that market for over 50 years. And I've been in that market over 30 years now. As I speak now, when I went through the documents, there are names that are there who don't belong to the old structure. As when we came, her name was not there. My mom, my mom has one shop, then my auntie also one shop. Their names were not there. So I asked, why is their names not there? Actually, when we came, we even had misunderstanding with the, those sharing the shops. So we have to vacate the place. About two days later, they called her and gave her one shop. So as I speak now, we've been given only one shop that is allocated to my mother. Currently, my auntie's name is nowhere to be found and she has no shop. We are, every, we are ready to make sure that any alien occupant who, who comes to the market, we are ready to, to suck the person out of the market. They don't belong there. So this is a sign of caution to whoever is in charge. If you know you don't belong to the market, you, you didn't have an old uh, document regarding the allocation of the shop, don't even dare, don't even come there. Whoever you, you gave your money to, go and look for that person and take your money. From the Kotokraba Market in Cape Coast, my name is Richard Kwejunya Akon for joining us. <laughs> The Parliamentary Select Committee on Health, Lands and Natural Resources says it will soon be inviting for questioning persons who are believed to have encroached on lands belonging to the Pantang Hospital. According to the Lands and Natural Resources Committee Chairman Francis Manu Adabo, they will also be meeting all the stakeholders on how best they can resolve pending issues on the subject. He was speaking after a joint Parliamentary Select Committee on Health and Lands visited the Pantang Hospital to get first-hand information on how land belonging to the hospital has been encroached upon by some private developers. We've seen the problems. We've gone around, they've showed us all the problems. Like I told you initially, we're going back to Parliament. We're going to invite all the stakeholders to come. And uh, we expect the hospitals to also come with their documents 
so that we'll look at everything and then we see how to solve the problems. We thank God we met some of the developers. So some of the developers will also come to the meeting and tell us how they acquired the land. So uh, this is step one. We expect that in Parliament all these stakeholders will be there so that we go to the step two. But we promise we'll get the problem solved. We know we have to get the problem solved so that the hospital can exist and then they can work very hard for the state. So um, within a short time, we'll ride back to the ministry and then we have a meeting. All these stakeholders will be there so that we get over the problem. So we first have to see the documents. We haven't reached there yet. We don't want to create any panic. Let's get the documents because from the director here, there were some court judgments and some of the people were, uh, you know, declared innocent. So we need to get to the root of the matter. We need to understand how the acquisition was done, how many years the lease, whether compensation was paid. We need to investigate all this. Because sometimes when they don't pay compensation, you see the landlord coming back after the expiry of the lease period. So we need to investigate all this so that we get the solution. But I promise we will do all that within a short time. We invite all the stakeholders to parliament and then they will come and prove. We'll get the documents, we'll study the documents, and the stakeholders will also come with whatever proof they have. And then the two committees, joint committee, will sit again and take a decision. Addressing the committee members, the director of the hospital, Frank Benning, said he is reliably informed the Lankwantanan Municipal Assembly did not issue any permit to private developers for, the con for construction on lands belonging to the hospital. Mr. Benning also listed funding as one of the many challenges facing the hospital, expressing his disappointment in the inability of the National Health Insurance Scheme to cover mentally challenged people. And I'm reliably informed by the coordinating director that they haven't given permits to any of the developers at the front. You see, so yesterday I was at the Lounge Commission and the advice was that they don't understand why government should even spend money to acquire the place when the assembly can just put a hole to it and say that in our scheme of place you can't develop this place and that's it, it puts an end to it. There are fundamental challenge in mental health is funding. It's key to everything that we do. Okay, and it beats my imagination why we are treated so differently from the general hospitals. Mentally ill people are the most vulnerable. They are the poorest we have in our societies. And national health insurance doesn't cover them. And I don't understand. Okay, so I take my hospital for example, and we have about 90 homeless, mentally ill people. About 90 homeless, mentally ill people who we take care of day in, day out. They are feeding, they are medicines, they are clothing, they are environment. And somebody has to pay for it, and money is not coming from anywhere. So usually what happens is, even though by law uh, the service is meant to be free, now we just go in contrary to the law. We're actually charging something from those who access the outpatient services. And then we take the money, and the little we make of it, we use it to feed the free people. And it's more than well, still ahead in the bulletin, President Okufuado at the media encounter on Tuesday spoke about the activities of the new patriotic party's vigilante groups in the first few months of his presidency and described their actions as regrettable. When I came to this job, I knew there would be difficulties. And I... Now, the Coalition of Domestic Observers is meanwhile calling on all political parties to disband their vigilante groups and in business which comes up after this break. President Akupado insists government would not be extending Ghana's program with the International Monetary Fund. The program is not going to be extended. We took the decision on coming in that the country had entered into this program in 2015. It was coming to an end in April 2018. The Finance Minister has since clarified what the President actually meant. We have those details coming up station. Thank you very much for joining me again on Business. Good evening and welcome. Now, President Akufuado says his government would not extend the IMF program. Some government officials had earlier hinted of a possible extension of the program by eight months. Addressing a section of the media, the Flux Half House, 
The president was emphatic his administration has settled on cutting ties with the IMF in November this year. The IMF program is not going to be extended. We took the decision on coming in that the country had entered into this program in 2015. It was coming to an end in April 2018. And we felt that to give a certain sense of stability and coherence to our country's economic policy making, that we would complete the program. And we're committed to completing the program. The last budget that is going to be held under the IMF program will be the budget that is going to be laid before the House in November by the Finance Minister. That will be the last budget of the Ghana government under the current IMF program. So there's going to be no question of an extending the program. The program is going to be completed. It's going to be completed. Um, and we will then be on our own. I mean, that's where most of us want us to be, to be on our own, to be able to mobilize our own resources to, to confront our future. And in an interview after the encounter, Finance Minister Ken Furiata said, though government does not extend or does not intend to extend the current program with the IMF, the effects of the arrangement would continue to be felt until the end of 2018. Mr. Foriata explained the IMF's influence on the budget would be felt all throughout next year. My budget covers it anyway, you, and that, that's the point that you're, you're, you're seeing. Yeah. So, um, and that's what I'm working on. My budget is going to cover January 2018 to December 2018, a budget in which I'll be doing with the IMF in November, December, and, and that's what we are all locked in. And, and, you know, I think what we should also realize is that the objectives of fiscal consolidation and macro stability um, are not something that we are going to um, uh, we are going to trade away. They, they are important to us if we are going to have a system in which we can pay real wages, um, where inflation will come down, and where the budget deficit will go down. And I think those are things that we share in common with the IMF. Now, nobody needs to come to me to tell me that 70%, no for 70% um, of debt to GDP is a good thing. I need to bring it down. Exactly. So even as we, people try to ascribe it to the IMF, I'm saying that, you know, if we had our own economy, would you want to do anything more than that? You can. And in another development, economist Dr. Joe Abbey says going off the IMF program is his warning that the decision not to extend the program could pose some challenges for the economy. At least it clarifies one part of it. I think that there's a question of this extension because um, there had been a call reportedly from the unions, labor unions, saying that um, the, the Ghana government should uh, try and terminate this thing as, as soon as possible. So it could be partly answering that. In practical terms, the issue about staying to the timeline of April 2018 and giving the starting point means that um, the effort to, to successfully complete will mean a sharper rate of fiscal consolidation, which means that unless we put our total minds together, it will mean a, a harsher austerity period ahead of us. Because you are trying very hard to, to restrain excessive borrowing. Your debt level is too big, so you want to bring it down. And, and the only way you bring it down is that you borrow less. And the only way you, bring, you borrow less will be to either raise your revenue collections and or bring down your expenditures. Because the deficit is nothing more than the, the difference between your total available revenue and grants and your spend, expenditures, including interest payments. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to close it? And at this point, we are working very, very hard, but the 
the unfortunate um, preliminary outcome is that the 6.5% of GDP uh, deficit target for 2017 will be very difficult uh, to achieve because the revenue picture um, is not looking good. And look and away from IMF issues, Chief Executive of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, GIPC, UOP Grant, is urging science students and creative innovators to seize opportunities provided under the National Entrepreneurship and Innovations Plan, NEIP, to be able to commercialize their research works. UOP Grant said the GIPC is leveraging on the $10 million seed capital announced by the president to create a platform for technology hub to the advantage of entrepreneurs in the country. This was at the sidelines of an evening encounter with nominees of the Africa Innovations Awards in Accra. The Innovation Prize for Africa IPA Award is an initiative which supports African innovators. The IPA Award seeks to unlock potential as well as accelerate the spirit of African innovation to promote homegrown solutions that enables prosperity on the continent. Although no Ghanaian has been nominated for this year's award, Ghana is hosting the prestigious event for the first time since its inception five years ago. In an interview with Joy Business, Chief Executive of the GIPC, Yofi Grant, said Ghanaian innovators must learn how to commercialize their products and services from the other participating countries. You could actually commercialize it and put it to good use. There are a lot of innovations that are being commercialized that you never hear about. You know, so that's why it is. But at least this is an event that rewards um, creativity and um, problem solving through innovation. Very much what Africa requires because most of these solutions are engineered for African problems. So how is the GIPC going to support these people to be able to commercialize these innovations? Well, that, that's an interesting question because um, on our own, um, we are actually going to create a portal that will highlight opportunities in Ghana. Um, not just innovative, but all the opportunities from region to region. And we think these are some of the ones that we'll put there. But I'm sure you, you heard of the National, uh, the National Entrepreneurship and Innovation Project that the President announced for which there's seed capital of um, $10 million. This will serve as, um, provide incubators for a lot of these businesses and, you know, technology hubs, etc., to enable them to go the next step and com convert them into businesses. So. Also at the event was Ziblim Idi, Deputy Minister for Tourism, Cultural and Creative Art. He was confident the event will provide the right platform for Ghanaian entrepreneurs. We are lucky and fortunate uh, to be hosting uh, one African event that will take Africa to the next level as far as innovation is concerned. Uh, I think anybody who follows development in Africa will appreciate the role that innovation plays in our development. And I think that uh, for us in Ghana, even though unfortunately uh, there is no single Ghanaian among the 10 nominees. Uh, I was just talking to Prof. Uh, Frimpon Barton and he uh, assures me uh, that next year uh, we will have Ghanaians uh, on, on board. Uh, so the whole event is about you know, giving awards to young innovators in Africa who are going to be the bedrock of the next African renaissance. In all, innovators from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Egypt, Kenya, Liberia, Morocco, Nigeria, South Africa, Uganda and Zimbabwe have been shortlisted for the Innovation Prize for Africa Awards. That's all I have for you by way of business tonight. Thank you so much for your company. For more business stories, log on to myjournalonline.com slash business. My name is Emmanuel Apuaji Riafe. Have a good evening. <laughs>
had not overstepped the mark and had not got into the news for all the wrong reasons. I refer to some of the invincible and Delta forces who got into trouble and gave the party and the government bad publicity. My often stated view, which I have communicated clearly to the law enforcement agencies, is that the best way of dealing with such incidents is to let the law take its course without any political interference. The young men have shown remorse and the legal process is working. I hope that we all learn the required lessons from these unfortunate incidents. And then there was the horrendous murder of Major Mahama. I trust and pray that the trauma suffered by the whole nation as a result of the incident will cure us, will cure us of the barbaric practice of mob justice. It is absolutely essential that we leave the prosecution and punishment of suspected criminals to the police and the judiciary. The Coalition of Domestic Election Observers, meanwhile, has called on all political and political parties to disband all existing vigilante groups in the country. According to Kodeo, these vigilante groups are to blame for most of the violence in the country during and after the elections. The coalition made these observations at a press briefing in Bogatanga after it held an engagement meeting with political party leaders and selected stakeholders in the Upper East region. Albert Ahen is national coordinator of Kodeo. At its post-election national stakeholders uh, workshop held at Aqua Safari Resort in Ada in the Greater Accra region from March 27 to 29, 2017. The Coalition of Domestic Election Observers, Kodio, made this subject of political vigilantism one of the pressing post-election issues for discussion and deliberation. This was in recognition of the danger that political party vigilante groups pose to the country's electoral politics and democratic development. A member of Kodeo's advisory board, Sheikh Aramea Shaibu, said, Kodeo's findings show that the lack of confidence in the nation's security agencies coupled with the lack of action from political leaders, are major contributory factors to formation of political party vigilante groups. As with the Tamale and other places already visited, complaints of security biases and mistrust continue to dominate the discussion. Again, there was also the belief that the security agencies are inadequately resourced to effectively deal with criminal activities, especially those committed by the vigilante groups. Further, there is the belief that the police service is not independent enough and always gives preferential treatment to parties in power and their supporters. There is the lack of effective mechanism to regulate the conduct and the activities of, of even known and registered political party groups. Albert Sorry's report for Joy News. Minister for Gender, Children and Social Protection, Uti Kofisa Jaba, has revealed government has renewed the focus on promoting productive inclusion, also captured under the Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty Program LEAP. The program, she says, is to ensure that the program is not reduced to a quote-unquote free money project. Speaking at the multi-stakeholder conference organized by Sen Ghana on social protection, the minister noted government's ability to undertake various social intervention programs have improved the living conditions of the vulnerable and disadvantaged. The ministry plans to increase, indeed, the number of beneficiaries from the current 212,000 households to 350,000 by the end of this year. Already, we have completed phase 2B 2016 of household targeting, and 93,000 beneficiary households will be validated and added to the program. Plans are underway to include special groups like women affected by fistula, people living with hemophilia and cerebral palsy, autism, whole in heart, breast cancer, and the like. We will also include communities where people are trafficked. 
that means human traffic prone areas as well as galaxy prone areas so that we can reduce the incidence of galaxy and human trafficking and thus create equality amongst those communities. You're watching Joy News Prime, but we're having some breaking news coming in right now. We're told of a fire at Job 600, which happens to be the offices of the members of parliament of this country. And we have Joseph Opukugakbo, who's there on the scene. He's our parliamentary correspondent. Joseph, what can you tell us about this fire at Job 600? And so, uh, uh, Israel, we understand that the fire started sometime around this. Around what time again? Around 6.30 p.m. All right. So in the last star, essentially. So the majority of our patients have been taken to us. This is a fire that happened on the tenth floor, where the office of the president was supposed to be there. All right, Joseph, we're having quite a difficulty hearing you. You, your line is not too clear. I would wish that you reposition yourself. Hopefully the line is going to get better so we can hear uh, clearly what you're trying to tell us. But you were indicating to us that the fire is on the 10th floor of, uh, the, of Job 600. Exactly. Uh, from what the fire service is now, uh, I've actually told it, it's been quite a large extent. What they are trying to do is to get out the school. So we're still having a difficulty hearing exactly what uh, Gakpo, Joseph Opoku Gakpo is uh, sharing with us. But we're told that there's a fire at Job 600. Job 600 happens to be where the offices of the M members of parliament are. And the fire, we're told, is on the 10th floor of the building. Now, the fire service have got into the scene, except their turntable ladders are all only able to get to the fourth floor. And so they're strategizing on how to tackle the blaze. We'll be taking a break and uh, we'll be bringing international news, but we'll be staying with the story. We'll bring you the very latest, uh, hopefully at the top of the uh, police station. We'll be back in a bit. So we're returning to our earlier breaking news, which is the fire at the at Job 600, where we have the MP's offices. We're going live. We have uh, footage of the uh, event. Well, we have right now the majority leader, Sir Chairman Sabon, so he's addressing the media. Let's listen in. Then from now on. Uh, you, you, you also mentioned that um, at a point in time you had difficulty accessing the place. So you say that there was some level of architectural lapses in the construction of this particular place? Well, I think I, think, um, I wouldn't say there were architectural lapses. This structure has been here uh, since time immemorial, you know, it's a colonial edifice, and this tube was there. Um, because we have been using buses to assess this place, I think maybe um, we would not factor the fact that these new facilities are high-rise vehicles themselves. Um, and you cannot really think what may happen tomorrow what vehicle is going to be manufactured tomorrow, which height that vehicle may have. So I wouldn't really want to attribute it to a structural defect. It's an old structure that we've tried to rehabilitate and uh, repurpose it for the use of parliament. Just to get uh, 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 another uh, aspect of that, the main gate to the parliament house was locked up. At the time, the fire service tried assessing the place, so they had normally, to move Normally at 6 o'clock, for security reasons, at 6 o'clock, unless there is a particular function holding here, that main gate is closed between 5 and 6 then it means in, in case of emergency, you all have to use one gate. 
there is there is this back the gates, right? There, there's not just one gate leading to this place. There are three main gates. If you if you if you like, if you are even have to assess the Council of State, and you may even have about four entrances to this place. Now the back gate, which has not been put into you know proper use now, is what is supposed to be used for such purposes. But because we're not even the the fire tenders were not too sure of the fact that this gate had been opened, they all used the main entrance and they ran into this problem. As I said, one had a problem. The rest of them were then um, told to assess the facility using the back gate, which is what they used, and they are safe. And is it true it took the fire service about two hours to bring fire tenders over here? <laughs> well, <laughs> that is not my remit. Uh, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to say so because. I've told you that this whole thing started around 6.30. When, when is the time now? It's about 7.30 now. So for anybody to tell you that, oh, it took them two hours to get here, it's, it's an over-exaggeration. It's not true. Like on the safety of your extent of distraction, at least, uh, from, from what you saw, how bad was the distraction? Haven't we haven't seen it. <laughs> we all have had to climb down, and we haven't gone upstairs yet. We've left the fire officers to be working on what is unfolding. So not until they declare the place safe for us and ferry some of us to the place. All right, so we have a, a break in that signal coming in from Parliament House, but we will be reaching uh, Joseph Opoku Gakpo to bring us up to date as to what exactly is happening. From what the majority leader is saying, they were apparently in the offices when the fire occurred and they've had to move out of those offices, leaving the fire service personnel to work to bring the fire under control. What we have we are yet to establish is whether the fire has been brought under control as we speak, uh, but we intend uh, to get those details for you in a bit. If we can get uh, Joseph Pukugako on the line to give us some visuals of the building, that would also uh, be helpful. But this is a story we're staying with. We intend to bring you some more details on that. In the meantime, government has been advised to consider the use of natural control me methods such as digging trenches around farms and introduction of natural predators like birds and planting of mixed varieties to deal with the outbreak of four armyworm infestation in the country. The use of biological methods, according to some experts who are gathered in Accra to discuss the way forward, is more effective to deal with the spread of the four armyworm outbreak. Matilda Wambega has details in the following report. An estimated 20,000 hectares of farmlands have been infected up from about 1,400 hectares as of April this year. Farmers have made huge losses as a result of this. To contain the outbreak, government introduced agrochemicals to help fight the threatening armyworm invasion. But a team of experts who are in Accra to discuss the way forward on the outbreak say the use of chemicals is not the way to go. The Director of Flower Production and Protection Division of the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome, Hans Dreyer says, government must adopt natural control methods. But the use of pesticide in an integrated approach is the last resort option. So we may not exclude it, but it's not the first choice. Because if we use it too early, we are getting into difficult problems. Uh, we have financial aspects because these products are not cheap. You have to use them properly and we have to be aware of the environmental risks and also the risk for humans if we consume the products. For example, if you use pesticides too late and depending on the chemical that you use, you may have, you may have residues in the grains, in the maize grain. So there is also a risk of, uh, for, the, for the people who eat the maize that they eat residues of the chemicals and depending on the chemicals this is a real, can be a threat to human health. The agrochemicals are being distributed free of charge as government is treating the invasion as an emergency and a disaster issue. An entomologist with the Plants Protection and Regulatory Services Department of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, Hannah Sewanuama, says it is untrue that the chemicals are not effective 
Vinav. She, however, conceded that the use of chemicals should be the last resort. Chemicals shouldn't be our first option because so we do giving these to the farmers. Yes, you, you see, in management of a pest, we look at the IPM in whole as a package. And if you look at us, cultural practice should come and then like the biological control we are elaborating on other measures and then even the chemical should be like a last result. But you see this took us as a nation as on our way. And with biological control, it is a long term process. As they are discussing here, you need to some documentation needs to go on, you need to do some background check to see that the bio agent that you are bringing in from the other country is not going to be a problem. So you need to screen it. It takes some time when it comes, you need to re is for it to multiply. But the issue is farmers don't have the patience. That is one thing too. It's about the we are going to consider biological control. Sharing of knowledge and offering technical support to Ghana and 47 other African countries battling the outbreak is the focus of the three-day meeting. So what we want to do is to facilitate and to make this uh, tax force more effective. And this is what we are going to do anyway in the other 47 countries in Africa. Then uh, secondly, we are putting in place uh, from now going forward uh, extension materials that will allow farmers to know, to identify and also look at management and control of this pest army womb. Recommendations from the meeting will be tested and adapted to local conditions across Africa via the farmers' field schools and other forms of adaptive research. Matilda Pumaga, Fujo News, Accra. Female cocoa farmers at Akpafu, a cocoa growing hub in the Hoa municipality of the Volta region, have appealed to government to put in concerted effort to make farm inputs available for farmers all year round. According to them, there has been perennial shortage of farm inputs in their area due to the huge number of residents who engage in cocoa farming. They further appeal to government to make special provisions for female farmers in accessing the farm inputs. Join us as Volta Region correspondent Fred Kwame Sari has more in the following report. 40-year-old Janet Adade is one of the numerous women who have abandoned their trades to engage in cocoa farming. Just like the others in this area, Janet Adade does virtually everything on her farm, which she started on a small scale and has gradually been expanding season after season. Madame Adade lamented assessing farm inputs has been a great challenge because a small quantity of the inputs are made available for distribution to the many cocoa farmers in her area. She pleaded with government to increase the quantity of farm inputs, requesting special provisions for women during distribution. The cocoa board has been giving us inputs, but I think if the government can increase it, even if they will sell it, we should get the, 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 the number that we are supposed to use in, uh, in our farms. And the cocoa seedlings too, if they will continue to do it, maybe I would I like the government to increase it because last year and this year, for instance, in our community, we have uh, uh, farmers and they couldn't get seedlings. We have to travel to another place to get seedlings. So if they can be increasing, especially our place here, if they can increase it, I would like it. And the inputs too, they should try and, and see to it that the women especially, they, they serve the women because they, we, we are facing challenges. They should, they should help the women. She also, on behalf of other colleagues, pleaded to benevolent bodies to provide them with processing machines and training to enable them process the cocoa beans into finished products. If an NGO will come to, to help us, give us machine, maybe we can start processing something. We have a women group, Kayo Women Cocoa Farmers in Akpa Domi here, and we are a, a group of 30 women, young women. And after, after, the season, after the season, maybe we are in the house and we can process something. So if an NGO, the government, whoever wants to come and help us, give us machines, set up a, a small something for us so that we can process something, they should train us so that we can do it. We can do it. We want to do something because the cocoa that is coming from here we, we, are, we, we have a lot of cocoa here, and we can, we can do that. Madame Adade also advised other females not to see farming as a male-dominated occupation, but identify it as a lucrative venture and get involved. Fred Kwame Asaro's report for Joy News. 
The UK's Foreign Office Minister of State for the Commonwealth has dismissed suggestions the former colonial power is seeking to make itself relevant in geopolitics as the Commonwealth of Nations sets out plans to rejuvenate. Lord Tariq Ahmad tells joining us Alid Atta, the move to re-energize the 52 member organizations is rather expected to boost trade, improve security and build a better future for member states. That's it for the bulletin. My name is Sergio Live. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night. This is Joy News Prime.